Beautiful. Welcome everyone. Welcome Horlick High School freshmen and all the teachers. It's going to be a very good day considering last or yesterday was very, very interesting internet wise. I want to say hello to all of our guests and the focus today. Uh, it's very exciting. We are going to hear from several different people from several different uh, businesses in our community. It's very exciting. Some of you I've never met before on this panel. So I, I look forward to hearing about what you do for a living. And um, I'm telling you, if you could see our teachers' faces, which some of you, you can, our kids love this part. They love this part. So uh, thank you for being part of this. I do want to start out and just mention, we have about five questions. And there's about six, seven people on the panel. And so when we think about we only have half an hour, if we can if we can hear really quickly some of the answers, it's kind of like that buffet where you take a little bit of everything. We don't get real deep. We probably aren't gonna be able to go back for seconds. So let's just go <laughs> surface level. And I'm telling you, we're gonna hear back from the students. And this is where we then, when they wanna hear more, we're going to ask if you would please come back as guest speakers and maybe go in depth with more as the, the, the juices start flowing with the students and they start asking some questions. So I wanna start out with, I'm gonna go ahead on the name here. I've got a list of names and I'm gonna ask that you introduce yourself, tell us about where you work and a little bit about your industry. So I have Marty first on my screen. Marty, would you mind starting us off? I saw was the early bird giving the clock in there. So I'm Marty Weissoff. I'm the injury manager for the tech center and also manager for the sample shop and our shipping and receiving area at Modine. Um, Modine Manufacturing has been here in Racine 100 plus years. Um, I've been here for 30 plus of those years. Um, <clears throat> as far as the industry, we're on, on highway, off highway. So city buses, school buses, semis, uh, dump trucks, excavators, earth movers, all of that type of equipment that's out there, whether it's a uh, engine cooler, diesel cooler, uh, charger cooler. We make all different kinds of heat exchangers for the automotive and stationary type equipment. And we're also just formed a whole new group on electric vehicles. So we're just getting into that as well. I've done a lot of testing uh, battery chillers and coolers um, out here in the tech center and our application engineering groups doing the development work of it and send it back here for us to try to break and to prove that it can perform how it's supposed to perform. Thank you. Greg, are you here? From Mauser? No, nope, we'll wait. Um, Eric, would you mind telling us a little bit about your industry and what you do? Sure, uh, my name is Eric Lind. I, I work for the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. Um, and I'm kind of an urban planner and a civil engineer. So I think that's why I'm on talking sort of about engineering, but um, first and foremost, I'm an, I'm an urban planner. So, um, we work with local governments, work with communities to, to plan out their, their land use needs, um, you know, how to use the land and the infrastructure that supports all of those different land uses, you know, where people live, where jobs are, um, that kind of thing, where parks are, recreation. Um, we, we work with groups to, uh, to preserve environmental features and uh, that sort of thing as well. So um, that's, that's sort of, uh, that's sort of what we do, and I can talk a little bit more about urban planning, and, and I'm guessing a lot of people haven't heard of urban, urban planning before, so I'll try to um, give an overview of that later. Great, thank you. Karina and Wesley. Good morning, I'm Karina Diaz, and we're here today to talk about a, a day in the life of a manufacturing employee here at SC Johnson. So I'll turn it over to my co-host. Um, I'm Wesley Duncan. Um, so I'm operations lead here at SC Johnson. And so we're in the uh, fast consumer goods um, industry. So uh, we make a lot of cleaning products that um, you've probably heard are used throughout your house, such as Windex, Ziploc, um, Drano are some of our major ones. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's a, about what we are. I left because my husband works over there and I think there's so much more going on. You guys are very, very modest. There's so much. <laughs> it's fun. We love it. Absolutely. There is. Autumn, please. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Autumn Alterdice and I work for the FAA or Federal Aviation Administration. I am sited locally here in uh, the Kenosha area. 
So I'm excited to be here, but uh, former airline pilot did that for many years before I came to the FAA. And uh, these days I work almost exclusively with drones and package delivery operations. And um, I was interested to hear uh, the other gentleman talk about electric vehicles because we work a lot with um, advanced aerial mobility vehicles. So people in drones. So lots of fun advanced tech stuff going on. Hmm. Bob. Um, so my background was originally in the architecture field, and I've actually been teaching at Gateway full time now for almost 14 years in the civil engineering and architecture program. Um, I'm also the chair of the engineering programs um, in general, so I cover the mechanical engineering and electrical. And what I love about this is we actually train students up in industries related to everyone who's talked so far. We have a drone certificate program. We talk about civil engineering and wastewater and freshwater. We design products. Um, we do 3D scanning. Um, so it's really exciting to have people from industry here um, that are available to, to talk to all of you. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, our next question is, what skills and education are needed in your career area? And if you can do a plug for math, I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> um, I, Marty, do you want to start again? Then we'll flip it back around, I guess. Sure. Yep. Um, troubleshooting skill, as far as skills wise, troubleshooting skills are really big in our test engineering world. Um, we have plans where we'll come in for the morning and work on work instruction. And by the time I get in the morning, the technician will start at six o'clock and they can't pull a test report. There's missing data. The pump won't start. Um, can't get a temperature. So your ability to walk in, I compare it to a medical doctor. I don't feel good. This doesn't work. So now instead of a person, I'm working with uh, test equipment or equipment, um, whether it's building related, steam related, because we have heat. Um, there's just a lot of different hats that in the test engineering world that you wear. We're a bit of a chemist to work on our fluids um, to understand. So we have some chemistry. We have the English classes because we have to write the work instructions and we have to understand that. Of course, there is the math. Um, the calculus, I'll say being a manager for as long as I have, I've lost my calculus skills. I would probably have to Google a bunch when my kid was in high school. I, I was able to figure it out, but it was a little rusty. Um, so it, the, the other part of the engineering part, like I think Eric had mentioned, you know, engineering is a very broad stroke. Mechanical engineering can get you into sales. It can get you into uh, the virtual development where you're in front of a computer all the time. Um, in my world, in the test engineering world, it's a great basics of I'm in the lab, hands-on uh, mechanic, and then I'm at my desk coaching employees on the other engineering aspects of it, whether again, it's the homework, uh, getting quotes, working with contractors on building ideas on what size heat exchanger do we need? What kind of pump do we need to be able to go through it? So to get in the door here in a, a test engineering world, we need a mechanical engineering degree, a four-year me mechanical engineering degree. All right, um, Eric. Yeah, I will definitely back you up on the math thing. Um, math is, is uh, what is it? It's called the universal language, right? So um, there's a lot of things you need to analyze when it comes to engineering and, and urban planning. Um, I, was, I would say having those math skills, just you know, having a, a, a base knowledge for math, you can kind of learn how to do the, the different analyses you need to do um, in both planning and engineering once you, you, know, you get the education. Um, for as far as urban planning, I think you know maybe a softer skill that you need to uh, to get into urban planning. And one of the reasons I got in is just a desire to improve your community and try to address some of the problems that your community faces. Um, those problems are always always changing and um, seems to be they seem to be getting more and more challenging. Uh, but that's part of the part of the fun of the the career as well. Is you're you're constantly you're constantly using your problem solving skills to to try to come up with creative solutions. I like that. Karina and Wesley. Uh, yeah, for skills um, that I use in my daily um, routine, it's it's a lot of troubleshooting, um, like we kind of just talked about. So uh, on the production line, you know, you have different, different equipment and uh, different things happen throughout the day that you need to be able to uh, 
to address and fix in order to make the line run run better. Math is also a, a, a thing that we need. Um, making sure that our uh, operating efficiencies are, are where they need to be and um, track, tracking our downtime and all that kind of stuff. Um, as far as education for an operator, um, a high school diploma is, is bare minimum that you need um, in order to do that. But really, really that troubleshooting, that um, uh, mechanical kind of aptitude um, where you kind of can dissect what things, um, how things are operating and how things are, are working together. Is it the same for you too, Karina? Same sort of things? Um, yeah, so my role is a little bit different, but I, I'm a learning consultant, so I help support all the line operators in the plant. So um, I help them with their training. So any new operator, whether they're coming in straight out of high school or maybe a little bit older, I set them up with a training plan and I help guide them through their probationary period and I help support their learning and, and help them grow with their skills. Very nice. Autumn. Well, I'm going to sound a little repetitive here, I guess, uh, with everybody. <laughs> um, if you're looking at more the traditional aviation side, it's a lot of things. It's problem solving, it's ability to multitask, it's physics. Physics is huge, right? When you're flying something in a 3D space, whether it's a drone or an airplane, a general understanding of physics is hugely important to that. Math, uh, I'm not a huge calculus person, so I'm gonna uh, not go on Marty's string here, but algebra and all of the other kind of basic math skills are, are paramount to be able to do all of, you know, just the basic math to fly an aircraft, all the weight and balance that you have to perform. Um, another one which I'm a huge, <laughs> huge lover of is weather. So it's kind of a different aspect of science that people don't as much talk about, but um, whenever you're flying in the national airspace, understanding of weather, weather patterns, and all those sorts of things, um, will help you be much more successful. When you're looking at, um, I guess, both the traditional side and the drone side, you need to add not only the mechanical expertise that's needed um, and understanding of those systems on an aircraft and how they interact, um, but you're also more looking at computer skills, right? So the computer science aspect that I'm sure you guys are doing a lot more of than I ever did in high school, um, really understanding those systems, how they interface with each other, how the ground stations interface right with the aircraft. Over the last couple of years, I've learned way more than I ever thought I would uh, being an airline pilot uh, about 5G and um, signal loss and all these sorts of um, really technical things uh, that were not in my traditional area of expertise. Um, but I think that's the, the biggest thing with all of this, right, is taking what you know and where you've started from and then growing and expanding um, that area of expertise and knowledge, you never stop learning. I can get behind that. Bob. So of course, I don't want to just be a gateway commercial this entire time. So, um, <laughs> you know, everything that everybody's saying is, is really true. And I think, uh, you know, if we circle back to the math thing, I, I think of one of the bigger problems with math in school is sometimes we feel, we feel like we're doing it just for the sake of math. And once you start seeing math as a way to solve those problems, rather than just to do the homework, right? Um, it actually becomes fun. You you apply it without thinking about it, and it really becomes natural, and it's really um, a great thing. And if you think about it, we're all just solving problems. Um, we, we think of the word maybe engineer or something like that, and we're like, oh, I can't do that. But all you're doing is solving problems. If you're in management, you're solving budget and time problems. If you're um, civil engineer, you're solving society's, you know, issues of infrastructure and roads and planning. Um, you know, the, the troubleshooting, I, I really like what Marty said about troubleshooting. When you run into problems, they present challenges, but then you know how to fix them next time. You know, um, if something goes right, one of my favorite quotes is, if something goes right the first time, it means you've done it before. <laughs> that you know it sounds kind of backwards but that's what it means that you have experience in that so we have to keep pushing until we kind of hit those failure points and then we figure it out and there's a great satisfaction in that um in all of these careers so um it's really great to kind of hear that we have all this overlap and all these little bits of learning will kind of come together for people um for your students you know when they start exploring their career and 
I think the last thing I'll say for now is just, I think we pigeonhole um, ourselves into these career titles. You know, I'm an architect or I'm a, a civil engineer, or I'm a urban planner. And it's like, there's so many paths within that field. It's, it, it would be like saying the only people in a hospital are doctors and nurses. It's like, no, there's business people and managers and lawyers and insurance and reception. And there's so many careers within that one building that it's, it's hard to see that. When you drive past an industrial park, you just think there's a lot of buildings, but there's so many different careers within that, any one of those buildings that it's pretty amazing. So Bob, then I'm gonna ask you since you're here, um, tell us a little bit like your career path to your position and what you love about it. Sure. Um, one of my favorite parts about teaching um, is the, the ability to tell my stories from the field, um, to tell my stories about code and problems and clients. And I point out some of the buildings I've worked on. Buildings last a little while, so they'll outlast me most likely. Um, and my career started, I went, finished high school and went to UW-Milwaukee and then started working at various architecture firms. And somehow I became the computer guy, the CAD guy. And I was always that plus the architect. And that led me to teaching one night a week, teaching CAD. And then eventually after getting licensed and practicing for a little longer, a teaching opportunity came up. And all of a sudden I found myself as a full-time teacher. And I never planned on that. But lo and behold, that's another vein of architecture uh, that was needed. And um, it's the longest single job I've ever had. And I love it. And I still practice architecture when I can. So um, the career path is well planned out as I thought I had it. Um, I had good drafting skills, good math skills. And I also liked art. And somehow that combined into the architecture school. And sometimes I wonder how I made it through that, but I did. And then you know, life keeps moving forward. Um, one other quick story, my son graduated high school and went into um, a machining, a machinist shop job. And then um, he was hesitant about joining their apprenticeship program. He wasn't sure if he wanted to do this forever. So he did it and he went through it and got through it in his two years and he's doing great. And he looked back after that two years and went, I'm so glad I did this. If if I would have gotten to this point, right, two years later and thought, oh, I should have joined that school, right? You won't regret starting. You won't regret starting. So jump into something because um, time, as everyone will say here, goes fast. It really does. Autumn, would you mind taking us on your career path and tell us what you love? Sure. Uh, it is definitely, I think, as Bob said, it, it was not the straight, narrow path that, that I had mapped out for myself either. Um, my parents were very strongly against me going to school for aviation, even though that's what I, what I wanted to do forever. So um, I actually started out college with a Japanese major and um, went forward with that for three and a half years and was like, man, I really just want to go fly. So um, that's what I did. I went uh, to flight school. I became a flight instructor. So I got to teach a lot of other people how to fly, um, both in the classroom, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and then also, um, you know, obviously in the aircraft as well. And I became an evaluator. So I was then giving check rides uh, for the students at our flight school. And um, that's kind of the typical pilot career progression path. So you gain hours because it's very expensive to learn how to fly, especially professionally. Um, once I got all of my certificates and experience, I then was able to move on to an airline, became a first officer um, and a captain, absolutely loved every minute of it, knew that's exactly what I was born to be doing. Um, I did actually go back to school and finished um, with a bachelor's in history. And um, after about five years, I wanted to start a family and just wanted to be home more. So I took a job with the FAA or Federal Aviation Administration as a operations inspector. So I went out and did check rides and inspected flight schools and um, for a variety, I both did general aviation. So your flight schools, your charter type operations. Um, and then I also moved over to the airline side, which I was a little more familiar with, then was doing evaluating training programs, um, manuals and doing check rides for their pilots as well. Um, after that, I kind of wanted to branch out a little bit 
Um, as I think Bob was talking about, right, it's never a straight path, um, which is actually what I love about all of this and hearing everybody else's story. I know that I'm not alone in that, um, which is awesome. But um, went on to move actually into safety management systems. So really understanding the risk-based approach to all those things that we do. So, you know, it's something as simple as a checklist that your pilots use, right? Why do we use a checklist? Well, you think, oh, that's just part of what we do. Well, there's actually a lot of research and study and science behind why we use checklists and flows, which is kind of moving our hands around the aircraft in a certain pattern um, that we have to work really hard to memorize in flight school, by the way, and our training. Um, and there's reasons fundamentally for all of that. So I enjoyed learning about all of that. I actually got a master's in psychology then, which, uh, you know, as I introduced myself to all my instructors, they're like, so let me get this straight. You have a degree in history, you're an airline pilot, and now you're getting a master's degree in psychology. <laughs> I'm still figuring out what I want to be when I grow up is the short answer, right? And that's the best part about it is you get to evolve and kind of figure out where your passions lie. About uh, four and a half years ago, um, my husband was actually going for his master's in drone engineering and somebody at work said, hey, you know, we need some people to do this drone stuff. And I was like, well, sure, sounds interesting. Why not? And uh, over the last four years, I've actually become um, the person to have signed all the certificates um, for all of our professional drone pilots in the country doing um, drone package delivery. I've gotten to help develop all of our policies and regulations that we're working on um, and really steer this whole next generation of aviation. So I found tremendous satisfaction in taking my many, many years of aviation experience and finding new and creative ways to apply, um, apply those or modify those um, to kind of the, the next era of aviation. So you know, to echo really what Bob said, just because you start somewhere and on a path doesn't mean that you, it won't diverge and kind of, you know, take you on paths that are unexpected. But I think that's the most exciting part. So you're never stuck somewhere, right? You can, there's so many areas and ways that you can take your personal interests and apply them or discover new and exciting things you never thought you'd get involved in, um, but really end up loving. Love it. Karina and Wesley, take us on the journey of how you got where you are. All right, for, uh, for me, I started as just a production operator. Um, and then through my time of learning the processes that, uh, that I was in the production lines that I was on, I was able to um, actually bring in some equipment um, and start up brand new lines. Um, recently, we brought in like thermal forming packaging. So I was able to be kind of that uh, lead operator on that project and really build it from the ground up to where it is today. Um, because of the work that I did with that, that led me into the role that I'm in now, which is uh, an operations lead. So now I kind of run a production line instead of uh, just operate equipment. Um, also, like kind of what Bob touched on, you know, at SEJ, it's a really big, big place. So we've got all different types of careers here. And uh, one of the things that I was able to also get into, um, as well as the operations lead, is the fire brigade. So here we have our own private fire department on site. Um, I'm part of that. So with that, I've learned um, hazmat operations. I've learned uh, confined space, high angle rescue, um, emergency medical responder. Um, I'm also a lieutenant on that. Um, so that's, I've been able to grow my leadership skills through, through that and almost have a second career path, you know, if I choose to, to go down that road. Um, so along with that, uh, like I'm actually going to school now for a bachelor's degree in business management as well. That's a perk of, of working with the company. Um, that it's very nice that they um, reimburse me for my tuition um, as long as I'm passing the classes and, and whatnot. So they, they help continue to grow my career path here as well. Um, that's one of the things that I love about this company. It's really that, that family company, which, which they, they advertise a lot. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I got to where I'm at. I, mean, I don't know if you want to go on yours. Um, yeah, so my, and it's funny because I don't think I knew that about you. So <laughs> mine's kind of similar too. I, um, out of high school, I, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grow up. So I just enrolled in college and started taking classes. I have several associate degrees. I'm still working towards my bachelor's degree, but in that time, I was working for a dental manufacturing company for 
um, 10 years um, before I started here at SCJ. And during that time, I learned that I had a passion for training and helping other people. And I was really good at it. So anytime there were opportunities to try new things or do new things, I was the first one to raise my hand and jump in. And um, that experience helped me get the job that I have today, along with my continuing education classes. So the role that I have, it was, it's not something that I just jumped right into. It was definitely a gradual thing of learning who I wanted to be, what I was good at, and knowing because I was really good at that, that's where this was the best fit for me to move forward in my career. Very nice. Uh, Eric. Sure. Um, so my, I guess, starting in high school, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I, I thought about engineering a little bit because I was pretty good at math and I liked liked math in general until we got really advanced. Um, then I got, you know, a little bit off of math, but uh, I went into, to, I graduated high school and, and went to a public university, one of our great UW system schools. Um, not knowing what I wanted to do. I, and it probably took me a couple of years in school to figure it out. I took some aptitude tests that, you know, just to say, okay, this is, these are my interests. These are the things I think I'm good at. And um, this thing called urban planning kept popping up and I'd never heard of it. So I looked it up and um, I took some really interesting classes in geography, uh, both human geography and physical geography, um, economics, just understanding how the economy works. Um, and from there, I applied to the urban planning program at UW Milwaukee. And, uh, and one of the cool things there, which is why I've kind of got the planning and engineering, um, kind of got both aspects of my, my career is they had a dual degree in, in um, urban planning and civil engineering that focused on transportation. So I'm sort of a transportation planner slash engineer by, by trade. Um, and getting that, getting a master's degree in both the planning and engineering um, I've, I kind of understand there's a little bit of different language for engineers and planners. And, and so I kind of understand both of those languages and uh, can, can speak them to my, my coworkers and the people I work with. Um, and then just over the years, I've been able to, to work on a variety of different tasks that sort of fall under there. But um, in, in my education, it was more about learning how to learn rather than, you know, going into my job and knowing exactly how I was going to do it. Um, so I, every day I'm you know, learning something new and, and tackling different plans and projects. Um, I think you asked what we love, what we love about our career, um, the variety. I think there's a lot of different variety. I've, I've worked on a lot of different projects, transportation, land use, um, environmental projects, things like that. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's challenging work. It's, it's never easy, but I would say I guess I would encourage people to uh, to consider finding a challenging career. You know, don't find something that's going to be easy and boring because you're going to get tired of it. Um, find something that's going to challenge you and and change, um, and be ready to change with it. Marty. So yeah, being the last instead of the first, uh, I see where you guys end up. Uh, a lot of the same. I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school. <clears throat> I, I am the youngest. I had a brother and a sister. They did not go the school route. Um, my dad passed away when I was two, so I didn't really have, uh, my brother was delivering newspapers from Milwaukee Journal at the time. I'm like, I don't know what I want to do. Um, school was heavily pushed throughout counselors and everything else, so I started off at Gateway. Um, got a degree in electromechanical technology, the robotics degree, and one in fluid power. And it was actually uh, one of the, my fluid power uh, instructor, uh, Stu Vorpeg, I still remember that guy. Um, all these years later, he motivated me to say, hey, you should consider a four-year degree. And I didn't have money to go to school. I, my mom didn't give my brothers and sisters any money to go to school. So how the hell am I gonna do this? Um, through my gateway degree, I got a job here at Modine after getting the two-year degree. And they did the, uh, assistance program for me. So um, I went through a lot of school at night. I'd work during the day full time and go to school at night. Uh, getting a mechanical engineering degree, I wish I had this opportunity because again, I did not know what a test engineer was. 
I really, when I looked at the job boards, there wasn't a job that said looking for mechanical engineer. Um, kind of was freaking me out a little bit toward the end because I, I even, as I looked at job boards at uh, MSOE where I was going to school, um, boy, that's when the light bulb started coming on the mechanical engineers everywhere. On the job board, I saw armor plating for a company in Minnesota. I saw uh, a diaper manufacturer. I saw, it, it was across the board, paper mills. I mean, it was everywhere. And that's when I started getting really excited for mechanical engineering degree and where I could go with it. Test engineering, it's kind of funny because uh, they built the new tech center back in 2000 and that's right when I was graduating. And that was the first time I was ever introduced to a test engineer. And that goes back into why I love my career as a test engineer, because I was not well suited to sit in front of a computer all day and do modeling or just learn condensers or just learn oil coolers. Um, in this field, it's a hands-on approach. Like I stated earlier, um, yesterday morning, I was looking at a chiller and we're looking, following the piping train to find where the bleed lines are because we weren't getting the flows that we were at. And, I'm out there with the guy. I'm still opening valves, trying to figure out what was wrong with the system. Um, and then it's back to my desk and then I'm doing budgets for the next two hours. So it, it, that, that love and that balance of, I, again, I'm not well suited. My wife hates me when I watch TV because I'm always changing the channel. I'm just one of these guys that I gotta, I'm, I'm moving commercials on, what's, what's next? Um, I, I just like that variety. And in this test engineering world, I kind of stated earlier, you know, there's the chemist part, there's the programmer part, there's the PLC part, um, there's the strength of materials part, you go do burst test on materials and you're understanding the materials, there's the statics, the dynamic, I mean, all these disciplines that are there, um, that's really what I, I love about it. And uh, we have guys here that have become the resident experts of oil cool. You can ask them any question, you can ask them any refrigerant question. Hey, my pressure is this. Oh, your temperature must be that they just know I'm more strung out on all these disciplines and I rely on those guys to help me. So it's not just me. It's usually a team of people uh, working through it. So I love it when a plan comes together. I couldn't wait as a kid when I got that expert Lego set and it had like the cylinders, the little Legos that went up and down on the engine when you pushed the car because it was all linked through gearing and all these other aspects of it. I, I I'd still put it together today. I, I love doing that stuff. I love it when a plan comes together um, and go to that troubleshooting mode when you push it the first time and the damn thing falls apart and you're looking at what you did wrong and how to fix it so it does work. It's just very, very satisfying when it does. Uh, and that's what I love about this job. So we have about a minute. And so no pressure y'all, but you have about 350, 14, 15 year olds listening. And so here's the question what advice would you give to our students or your 14 or 15 year old self if you could go back? And I'm going to start with Bob on this. <laughs> Sign up for Gateway. No, um, uh, <laughs> keep moving forward, you know, um, and ask, ask questions. No one expects you at your age or whether you're my age of 47 to to stop asking questions. Um, we feel like we need all the answers and really that just means you need to ask for help. Um, so keep moving forward and ask questions. Autumn. I would say, don't be afraid to dream and push hard for, if you feel that you are meant to do something, go for it. Don't, don't stop because other people tell you no, even if that's your parents, find a way to do it, you know, because you, Although Bob is right, some people, and I think most people, I think I'm probably the exception, don't know what they want to do or what they're meant to do in life. But if you feel that strongly, go for it. Don't, you're going to have to work hard for it. Don't be afraid of that. Lean in. It will be totally be worth it. Karina and Wesley. Yeah, for, for me, I kind of piggyback off of Autumn, like, don't be afraid to fail either. You know, try your path. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. There might be something else. At least you know that that's not for you. And you can try whatever else that you, you like to do. Because like all of us have said, we, we haven't really figured it all out, right? We don't know exactly where we're going to end up. And the only way to do is to, to try, to try and see if it works. So that would be my advice. 
I don't think I could say, have said it any better. <laughs> I have three high schoolers, so I've already had this conversation several times this year. So 100%, I think Wesley said it really well. It's just try, try what you think you might like. And you know what? Now is the time when you're young and you have, I shouldn't say no responsibilities, but a little less than maybe what's to come in the future. Just try anything you like. And if you don't like it, try something else until you find something you're passionate about. Eric. I was, I'll echo on the last thing, find something you're passionate about. Um, I was also gonna say, ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to ask dumb questions. I think the some of the smartest people in the world are the ones that keep asking questions and trying to find answers. Um, and, and, and also just kind of soak in all the options. You, you've heard from a number of people that have completely different career paths here. And we're in one sort of sector of the, of the world, right? Um, there are so many options out there, you know, explore them, find something that you like. Uh, and then echoing on some of the other panelists, if you don't, if you end up not liking it a couple of years down the road, it's not too late to switch, right? So try not to stress about that. Um, try not to stress if you don't have any idea what you want to do, because uh, you, you can still figure it out. You guys are young. <laughs> Marty. Take advantage of this. I only wish I had these opportunities. It's a driving motivation for me to come to Modine and give tours and to sit on these panels, um, hear what we have to say. I too have two kids. One just started at uh, Stout and the other one's two years out of high school, still trying to figure things out, getting started in some welding. Um, reminds me of me. I, I really had no idea. And even doing this, trying to apply it to the home life, it is, I know you had said you had three kids in high school as well. It is the, the, the fear of making mistakes. It's over and over and over again. Um, don't look at it as mistakes. Look at it as a lessons learned. I didn't make a mistake. I learned something. That's what you got to do. You didn't make a mistake. You learned something. I think that's a big takeaway. My goodness. I wish I could go back to school for everything that you guys are talking about. There just is not enough time. And time does go by awfully quickly, doesn't it? Um, I want to thank everybody on this panel. Thank you for finding time to talk to our young people. Um, any last words that you want to throw out there and then I'm going to let them go because I know that they have an assignment to do the, the high schoolers, but I'm going to open it up if you've got something to say. Otherwise, um, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Anybody have any last words of wisdom that you want to say and send us off? Was it the words words of wisdom that scared you there? Like, <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Horlick Freshman, for coming into this the second day. And uh, I bet you've got some questions. So I appreciate this. Thank you very much. Just gonna stop the recording. <laughs>